Good evening. Good evening, good afternoon, good morning. Uh, welcome to the uh, second session of the Terra Incognita workshop. And this session is on subcortical research in clinical context. Uh, my name is Bernadette van Wijk and I will give you uh, an introduction of the session. So just a uh, brief reminder of our format. Uh, we will have four speakers in this session and each speaker prepared a 30 minute presentation and each presentation is followed by a 15 minute discussion. And uh, if time allows, I'd like to hold like a two, three minute break after every discussion session. So to just give our eyes a little break from, from staring at the screen the whole time. And if you have any questions, please use the uh, chat window and uh, direct the questions to me. And uh, I will then, uh, just like Pilu did in the first session, uh, read them aloud uh, to the speakers. So I probably don't need to convince you that uh, mental health issues are a huge problem uh, for many countries or most countries in the world. And uh, the World Health Organization estimates that one out of four people will experience some form of mental health problems or illness during their lifetime. And anxiety and depression are the most common disorders with 264 million people suffering from depression and 50 million people suffering from some form of dementia, uh, 45 million or so people suffering from bipolar disorder. So these are really huge numbers. And also neurological disorders really take away valuable years of our uh, healthy life. So due to premature death or people having to live with the disabilities that uh, impact the quality of life. And for, for younger adults, this is mostly due to, to headaches. Uh, and for older adults, uh, more due to like stroke and neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's and, and Parkinson's. And uh, yeah, from both mental health illnesses and neurological disorders, we're still struggling how best to prevent those disorders and how to treat them. And yeah, we're struggling because also we have a lack of understanding on some really vital aspects, like what the exact risk factors are for, for some of these disorders that make people prone to developing the disorder, what exactly the disorder does to the brain, and uh, how we can provide people with an early diagnosis so we can try to stop for the development of the disorder. And then also, what, what should we do exactly as a treatment? And so further research is, of course, very uh, important. And for this workshop, I uh, wanted to make a list of disorders that are known to affect only the cortex and a list of disorders that are known to also affect the subcortex. And so I started with the cortex. And this was actually more difficult than I thought. Okay, maybe one could say that if you have a very focal stroke or brain tumor, it only affects cortical tissue. But yeah, this does also not seem very likely to me that it's so focal. There are also disorders that are associated with increased cortical excitability, like epilepsy and migraines. But can we really be sure that this is not due to some larger network effects that also affect subcortical structures? And then there's frontotemporal dementia. At least the name suggests that this is a cortical disease. But I think some of the speakers in our session today might actually object to uh, frontotemporal dementia being a cortical disorder only. So if you happen to think of any other disorders that only affect the cortex, please let me know in the chat because I could only think of uh, disorders that are also associated at least with some abnormalities in subcortical structures. And this might not be an exhaustive list, but I think you get the gist that uh, in order to understand these diseases, we should also really pay attention to also the subcortex. 
And in addition to the challenges of studying the subcortex that Pilou already mentioned, there are a number of additional challenges that comes with clinical research. Uh, first of all, we need to determine whether something we observe is normal or abnormal. So physiological or due to the disease. And this is quite a challenge because our brain structure as well as activity patterns are quite vari variable uh, across individuals, but also within the same individual across uh, the lifespan so as we age. And uh, yeah, there are several sources that, that cause this variability like gender, uh, genetics or plasticity effects. And then there are all sorts of um, unexplained variables that can cause inter-individual variability, but that don't necessarily need to be harmful. So the brain can be quite resilient to alterations in, in structure or activity and not showing any signs of uh, dysfunctions. Once we have identified something as abnormal, there are then a number of follow-up questions. Like, is this the only thing that is abnormal? Or is it perhaps uh, like a byproduct of, of another uh, feature that is more directly related to the disease. So what causes it? Uh, how does it lead to dysfunction? And can we do anything about it? And I would like to sort of um, highlight these questions uh, in the, in, for one particular application that was developed especially for the subcortex uh, called deep brain stimulation. Deep brain stimulation is electrical stimulation via electrodes that are implanted inside the brain in one or more uh, subcortical structures. And these electrodes are then connected to a, a wire that goes under the skin that's connected to a pulse generator somewhere near the chest. And so this is an invasive procedure, right? So the electrodes are surgically implanted and they actually stay inside the patient's brain probably for the rest of their life. And the brain stimulation has become really an established uh, treatment for advanced movement disorders like Parkinson's disease, uh, dystonia and essential tremor. And especially in the last two decades, there have been a large increase in the number of patients that have been successfully treated with deep brain stimulation. But there are also still many technological developments going on uh, regarding the devices. So they are getting smaller. Um, we get increased uh, battery life of the pulse generator. We are getting more and more possibilities for customizing the stimulation to the individual patient based on additional recordings or based on the symptoms that an individual patient might have. And so depending on the uh, disorder of the patient, these electrodes are implanted in different uh, targets. Uh, for Parkinson's disease, it's typically the subthalamic nucleus, but for dystonia, it's the internal polydom. Uh, for essential tremor, it's the VIM thalamus. And for Parkinson's patients with postural control problems, it's the pedunculo pontine nucleus. And these uh, targets all have in common that they are really deeply located inside our brain and at locations where like non-invasive uh, conventional techniques uh, that measure electrophysiological activity, so EEG and MEG, they really have, uh, yeah, have very have difficulties or it's maybe even impossible to detect an activity from these deep structures. And so it's really uh, fantastic for research purposes that we are actually also able to record uh, with these electrodes. So not to stimulate, but also record electrophysiological activity in the form of local field potentials. And so these, these time series actually very much look like EEG signals. And you can also analyze them in the same way as EEG signals. But of course, uh, we already run into a first problem because how do we know that what we uh, are recording is, is normal or due to the disease? Like obviously, we're not gonna put these electrodes into a healthy person's uh, brain for comparison. 
Uh, but what we can do is that we can um, look at any changes in these recordings uh, before and after giving patients their uh, regular dose of medication. And one uh, established finding in, in Parkinson's disease is that levodopa medication, dopaminergic medication, uh, decreases the amplitude of so-called beta oscillations that are uh, present in these LFP recordings. And beta oscillations are uh, neural activities between the frequency range, uh, ranges of 13 to 30 hertz. And the amplitude of these beta oscillations actually also correlates with the severity of the disease as measured via UPDRS uh, rating skills, so clinical skills. Uh, so meaning that uh, the larger the amplitude of uh, the beta oscillations in the recording, the more motor impairment uh, the patients uh, tend to have. And also when we actually switch on the stimulation, we see that these beta oscillations uh, disappear in line with an improvement in uh, motor uh, functioning. And finally, uh, very uh, importantly, when we actually stimulate, not at these uh, clinical frequencies of 130 hertz, but at the frequencies of this beta oscillation, we see that the movements actually uh, become even slower, so further impairing patients. And this really suggests that there might be a causal link between these beta oscillations and motor impairment. However, uh, High amplitude beta oscillations in the subthalamic nucleus are not the only uh, data feature we associate with Parkinson's disease. Uh, we also know that there are increased firing rates of neurons in the SDN, of bursting activity, of abnormal um, oscillations in other frequency bands. And for other structures in the brain, like the, the motor cortex, it might actually not be so much about the amplitude of beta oscillations, but the waveform shape of the oscillation, as can be detected with phase amplitude coupling. So uh, high amplitude beta oscillations in the SDN are certainly not the end of the story in Parkinson's disease. Do we know what causes it? Well, probably the lack of dopaminergic cells in the substantia nigra that underlie Parkinson's disease. And computational modeling studies are looking into how this lack of dopamine could then lead to, to an increase in beta oscillations in cortical uh, basal ganglia thalamic circuits. We're not exactly sure how it leads to dysfunction. We know that uh, beta oscillations are strongly associated with movement, but we don't know exactly why high levels of beta oscillations really uh, alter the output to our muscles. And can we do anything about it? Well, in this case, uh, for deep brain stimulation in Parkinson's disease, uh, we can actually uh, do something about it, but we are mostly treating just uh, we are treating just the symptoms of the disorder and not curing the disorder. And also many patients uh, actually suffer from side effects of stimulation, like dyskinesias, um, speech disorder, speech problems, uh, depression, apathy. So it's still, there's still a lot of uh, room for further improvement of the treatment. And this is in fact also part of the challenges in the field of deep brain stimulation. Can we really find good stimulation settings for individual patients that don't lead to any unwanted side effects? Where exactly should we place those electrodes? And can we make the uh, brain stimulation as effective for other uh, disorders like mental illnesses as it is for movement disorders? And these are challenging questions, especially because we need a full understanding or fuller understanding of both the disorder as well as what stimulation does to the brain. So we have actually two things that we uh, should understand. But I think it's very encouraging to see that in this field, um, more and more um, people are using a combination of research techniques. 
And so people are using uh, neuroimaging, a combination with electrophysiological recordings and post-mortem anatomical atlases and computational models of, of stimulation. So it's really exciting to see this integration of research techniques. And I think this is very promising for uh, further developments in this field. And this diversity of research methods uh, is also reflected uh, in the program for our session. Uh, so we uh, will start with uh, a presentation on deep brain stimulation, but then after that, we're going to switch to different topics and different research techniques and different brain structures, uh, but all uh, related to neurodegenerative disorders, so movement disorders and uh, Alzheimer's disease. And so we have a great lineup of speakers, uh, Dr. Martijn Beudel, uh, Dr. Timman, Lea Grinberg, James Rowe. Um, all of them are initially trained as a clinician, and uh, I think all or most of them are also still actively uh, treating patients, so they know exactly what the challenges are in the clinic. And uh, I'm going to keep my introduction of the speakers a bit brief, but I urge you all to read the uh, biographies they provided in, in the program. And so uh, let's start with our first uh, presentation by Martijn Beudel. He is uh, affiliated or based at the Amsterdam University Medical Centers, and he's going to highlight to us some of his experiences with the latest uh, DVS uh, developments uh, in technology. So I'm going to hand over to you. <laughs> 